Maybe. And maybe we can get Dan. I was thinking about the bonobos. Maybe we need to do a presentation on the bonobos, Dan. In the there you future. go. Yeah. That would be <laughs> super fun. Um, <laughs> but we aren't talking about bonobos today. We're talking about birds. So Dan's a longtime educator at River Edge Nature Center, as well as everything else. And he's going pictures. to present some birding basics. Um, I don't know where everybody so, is. Um, Dan, what we're going to do is, Natalie, uh, oh, can you easily okay. mute everybody? <laughs> so then we don't have, no one has to worry about if they're on mute or um, remember to put questions or comments in the chat box. And uh, Dan, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, real good. So everybody, this is the first time I'm doing this, so bear with me. I'm going to bring up our, our PowerPoint. I hope you can soon see it here. Let me just get it all set. There we go. All right. Um, one thing that Natalie and I did notice uh, when we were uh, practicing this, there is probably about a five to 10 second delay on my slides appearing up on your screen. So uh, just bear with me. If I start talking about something and you don't see it, it, it will pop up. Maybe it's just my, my internet being a little slow here. But anyhow, um, so it, it, this is kind of different for me because you know River Edge takes so much pride in its inquiry type learning uh, where we try to actually uh, dig the information out of our students. And, uh, and, and what we're doing here, obviously, is just me here talking. So uh, bear with me. And, and Natalie, just start waving at me, you know, if my four hours is uh, starting to run out or whatever. So it's a little dry humor. I can't talk that long anyhow. So but uh, just a quick little background. Um, it's really kind of funny because 50 years ago, 50 years ago today for me, I was a, a first year graduate student and, uh, <clears throat> in Wisconsin and my prof and I, my ornithology professor, we discovered redneck grebes nesting in Wisconsin, something that had never been identified before in Wisconsin. So then uh, for the next two years, I was his um, go-to guy, uh, his boy Friday, I guess. I was the one that was going out and beating the bush. We found out that the birds nested in very desolate lakes that had to be at least 10 acres in size because they had to run across the water to be able to take off. And we knew their types of vegetation. And this is a bird that usually nested in the Arctic. So uh, it really kind of stirred some interest for me. And, you know, following this project, I spent the next year's summers up in the Arctic from Norway, Iceland, Newfoundland. And uh, I worked on uh, the if you might know it's puffins, the elses and their nesting habits, which hadn't been recorded also, and, and got uh, <clears throat> a, a fair amount of recognition for my work out there. But that's, real briefly, that's kind of how I, I got started. So um, we're going to have a little fun today uh, in what we're going to talk about. I'm not, I just clicked a slide here. We'll see if it pops up for you. Uh, it is meant to be a little fun as far as uh, do the do birds uh, really transmit any disease There's so much about the coronavirus right now and uh, I don't know maybe they, they should have a, a minimum distancing for their nest two six feet apart or whatever but uh, I guess the uh, um, some birds would have difficulty but um, I show this and it's in a way it's not funny because you know, just 15 years ago or so, we had the, the bird flu, which was 80 to 90 percent uh, deadly to humans if they did get it, and quite a few thousand people died. So um, fortunately, the birds have, have no uh, um, involvement right now. I'm moving on to the next slide, which you'll see in a second, hopefully. And, uh, it's a Kessel Quilatus, and, and the reason I'm showing this bird is that uh, it's a dinosaur. 
okay, dinosaur. It's the largest bird. It lived in North America, believe it or not, and it's huge. And I'm on a slide right now that's showing um, an elephant and a Quetzalcoatlus and a, and a giraffe, and you can see that, which you'll see in a second here, is is like a 500 pound bird, 36 foot wingspan, the size of a small jet fighter plane, 16 feet tall, tall as a giraffe. And we had these things living here. You might think, why am I, why am I talking about this dinosaur that lived 60 million years ago? And not to offend anybody today, but what we'll be talking about is, is a lot of scientific theory. So uh, if, if you're not a believer in uh, dinosaurs or whatever, remember this is uh, scientific theory that I'm going to be projecting here because it kind of is going to show the transition from, from reptiles uh, to the, the birds we'll be talking about today. A funny thing, my, my grandson, <coughs> Uh, animal, uh, he calls it a bird, actually it was a dinosaur, and he says, Grandpa, Grandpa, what does that thing eat? And I says, simple answer is whatever he wanted to eat. All right, we're moving on here. In a second, you will see a picture of Archaeopteryx, uh, kind of a yellow looking screen. I hope things are moving along for you too. And this, we can't talk about birds without talking about this particular critter right here, Archaeopteryx. Um, one thing I want you to know is we're not going to be talking about birding today as much as ornithology. We're going to be talking a little bit about birding. We're going to be talking about how you can identify birds, but we're going to spend a little bit more ta time talking about some of the details of birds. and and where they rank among all other animals in the world, how many there are. And uh, you know, one of the last things we'll be talking about are the changes that have been taking place in ornithology just in the last uh, 20 years. Some of you who have been long-term birders, I'm sure you'll, you'll identify with some of the things I'll be telling you in a while. But Archaeopteryx was found in Germany, and this is the critter that we consider the transition between the reptile and the bird. Okay, back then, 165 million years ago, there were some dinosaurs, smaller sized dinosaurs that actually started the development of a feather. They called it a filament back then. And uh, these little filaments, it's kind of the start of the feather. These filaments eventually grew longer and longer and longer as things um, adapted. And uh, over a period of time, we ended up with something like this, like Archaeopteryx, which actually had these filaments that turned into long type feathers that allowed him to not so much fly, but to glide from place to place. He still had teeth which was a characteristic of a reptile. He had a, a bony tail, which most of you know, um, birds don't have bony tails. We'll talk more about that. But this little animal right here, Archaeopteryx, is really the transition piece from uh, what we considered the reptile to, uh, to a bird. All right, I'm moving on to another slide. It's gonna be a big pink slide and it's a, and it's a it's a big box if you look at this. And just for today, we're gonna to pretend this big box is all the different types of animals that exist in the world. And if you take note up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a small little gray box too. Hopefully you can see me pointing to it. And that's gonna be significant because of all the animals in the world, that little gray box is gonna show us where our birds fall into the overall scheme of animals. So it is estimated that there is about 1.262 million species of animals in the world. So about one point close, and actually this number is a little old. And, and just since I worked on this project, I started putting this PowerPoint together maybe five years ago, the numbers have greatly increased, and I'll show you where that has happened. 
I'm moving on to another slide now, and it's showing the backbone animals, okay, vertebrates versus invertebrate animals, okay? And if you notice, once again, now that little box I pointed to on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, that, cons that is, consists of how many backbone animals there are in the world. And you can see it's a very small number. The amount of invertebrates, no backbone animal, is well over a million. And if we start looking, that includes things like sponges, worms, crabs, jellyfish, clams, spiders, and the one on the very bottom, insects, and it says 950,000. And actually, some of the latest data I've looked at, that number is well, well over a million. And scientists actually project that insects will end up being two to three million in species numbers. So these species are, are, uh, are still being found. Species, even bird species, a lot of bird species are being found in, in uh, South America. And uh, um, it's, it's surprising. In fact, Jessica mentioned uh, when I was working with bonobos in Africa, when I was over there, uh, another couple that was working in an area not too far down the Congo with us found a new species of, of monkey. So mammals are still being found. All right, I'm moving on here to uh, animal with backbone. Okay, it's a phylum if we think about this in the taxonomy type of classifications. All right, they're chordata, chordate, meaning they have a backbone. And uh, um, you can see fish, uh, about 30,000 species of fish, amphibians, 6,200 species, 8,200 species of reptiles, just short of 10,000 species of birds, 9,956, and mammals, the smallest number, 5,416, maybe 5,417 since that monkey has been found, I'm not sure. But anyhow, um, we look at the bird number, just under 10,000, and quite a few, but surprisingly, if some of you didn't know this, there's only maybe roughly 750 species of, of birds in North America. That number varies, a lot of times you'll see bigger numbers because there are some birds that get off course, especially up in the Aleutian Island area. Some of the Eurasian birds uh, hit the uh, end of the Aleutian Islands, and uh, they then call that a, a bird that has been found in, in uh, North America. But I think a good solid number is uh, 750s, thereabouts. So not many in relation to some of the other in fact, uh, if I know, I'm not sure if Sunny's here, but she spends a lot of time down in Costa Rica. And here's a, a country the size of uh, West Virginia, and it has about three times as many birds as we have just here in North America. On to the next slide, it's characteristics of birds. And uh, <clears throat> I'll go so, uh, through these slowly as your screen changes here. and. Uh, first of all, number one says eggs, hard shell, different than like a snake or some of the reptiles which have a leathery shell. So it's uh, unique that all birds have hard shells. Now, one thing you have to realize in biology, there is always, always an exception to the rule. So if I say always or 100%, I guess I'm not always being honest with that, I mean, you look at things like the duck-billed platypus that lays some eggs, which kind of throws a wrench into the uh, live birth for mammals and so on. So there's always an exception to the rule. And then uh, uh, we have our, our feathers, which is unique. And I mentioned about some of the early 250 million year ago dinosaurs, some of the smaller dinosaurs actually started growing some filaments that ended up being feathers. And those filaments were actually uh, used at the time for thermal control, for warmth, just as the feathers for birds do today. But those animals have all died out. And uh, if, what I tell students many times, if you're driving down a road and you find a roadkill and it's just smashed and you can't begin to tell what it is, if you find a tiny little feather, you know it's a bird. 
So feathers are today unique to two birds. All right, our birds have beaks, no teeth. Now, um, you might say, oh, little ducks have these little tiny teeth inside their mouth. True, they're not really teeth. They're like a little siphoning device when they're eating. And uh, um, falcons, for example, have a tiny little nodule or tooth on the upper part of their bill uh, that's unique to falcons. Uh, but they're not truly teeth like we would consider teeth in reptiles or ourselves, for example. Birds all have wings. Whoop. Uh, birds all have wings, but they do not all fly very important. I'm sure we can all think of some of the birds that don't fly, like the ostrich, number one. Penguins are very common for people to recognize, but there are rheas, cassowaries, uh, emus, all types of different birds found in different continents that, uh, that are all flightless, and probably we can consider them low on the evolutionary trail, and we'll talk more about that, how we rank all these birds later on. Bipeds, meaning they have two feet, all have two feet, and obviously wings or arms have developed into wings. Endothermic, warm-blooded, and there is a characteristic very similar to human beings. We're going to talk a little bit about the, how some of the characteristics of birds are are equal to or surpass the mammals, not in brain size, but many other ways that uh, they are um, very well developed. And the four-chambered heart, for example, like mammals, they have a four-chambered heart, making them warm-blooded, right? Where reptiles and amphibians have fewer chambers, three chambers, and uh, they are cold-blooded. And if you don't understand that concept real quickly, warm-blooded means that the temperature never changes considering the temperature is outside. For a cold-blooded animal will be the same temperature as the outdoor environmental conditions. On to our next slide here, talk briefly about bird flight. And uh, although not all birds fly, it's important to understand flight. We're gonna be talking more about this because so many, so many of the body functions in a bird are, or have adapted, I should say, to uh, allow them to fly. So they have streamlined bodies, I'm going down my bird flight list here. Feathers, which we just talked about. You'll, we'll talk more about the skeleton. Their skeletons have adapted in such a way that allows them to fly that would not allow us to ever get into that position. Uh, internal organs, once again, uh, are set in such a way that uh, we'll get into more detail how they also allow birds to fly, the respiratory system, rapid meta metabolism, and wing design. I'm moving on to a wing design slide right now, which should pop up in a second. And uh, many of you might not know, if you actually look at, a, at an airplane, all right, airplane wing, uh, which is on the diagram here, is that about 85% of that airplane to lift off the ground is because of it being sucked up or less pressure on the top of the wing. It's not the air pushing the wing from the bottom, but it's drawing the wing upward because of the design. And if you look at those red arrows that should be on the screen, it's kind of showing the movement of air. And because of the top of the wing being a farther distance from the leading edge to the tailing edge, a farther distance going over the top, that air is moving faster, it causes less pressure, and that wing is being drawn upward. And you can see in the gull below, I think it's a pretty good example that the contour of the leading edge of his wing is very similar to this airplane wing. 
All right, next on the screen is the anatomy of a bird, and we're going to talk about the skeletal structure number one. And once again, just to think back to when I was talking about the ability to fly, so many of these systems inside of a bird are designed or have adapted that are allowing him to get lift. So number one, if we take a look at a bird skeleton, which is up on the screen right now, all right, we can see that uh, their skeletal structure is extremely light, all right? And uh, there should be a second picture, second view on that same screen showing you the internal cutout of their bone structure, very different. It's not filled with marrow like ours is and very heavy, but it's, uh, it's a group of tiny little cells and structures that give it an amazing strength, but also it's extremely light. Uh, a few other things, you can see that the neck vertebrae on birds uh, does vary from about 11 to 25 uh, neck vertebrae, different than, than us and human beings, all being a consistent seven, I believe I'm saying that correct. Their sternum is very well developed. That's down the center of their chest because they need a great support for those pectoral muscles, which are uh, allowing them uh, to muscularly to, to fly. All right, here I got a next picture is a picture of a uh, gray owl here, something found out in the Oregon area. And if you look at this guy, uh, if you had a cat that size, it would probably weigh about 12 to, to 14 pounds. But I'm going to bring up a second slide here that you just should see in one second. And it actually shows what's under all those feathers, that little red outline there is showing the the actual size of the bird under, under all these feathers. And that bird, if it was a mammal, once again, might weigh 12 pounds, but this bird only weighs two and a half to three pounds. So their system, once again, is set up in such a way, it's, the, it's a structural skeletal system that it, it's very light. Next, we're going to go on to the anatomy of the circulation system, all right? And uh, I'm just going to bring up a chart here, and it's going to show us the four-chambered heart. Four-chambered heart, much like ours, like human beings, all right? They're warm-blooded. The other thing about their system is that a bird's body temperature is probably about uh, eight degrees warmer than ours. So they have a, a warmer system, all right? And, but I think what's most unique, if we take a look at, there is a bird circulatory system chart that should have popped up for you right now. And the very bottom one, I think, is pretty amazing. First of all, you know our resting heart rate is probably about 70 beats per second. And if we start uh, doing some running or whatever we do, some heavy exercise, we might go up to 100. Once again, that depends on the age. If you're younger, it might be a little higher. I know mine goes up to 150 nowadays. That's maxing out for me. But looking at a hummingbird, its resting heart rate is 250 beats. All right. And then uh, when it's flying, or it, as it says, excited up on top, excitement, it can go up to 1,200 beats. So even if our hearts would go up to the resting heart rate of 250 beats, beats, our, our heart would probably explode. So the efficiency, once, once again, here is a, a particular system in a bird that is uh, quite superior to ours. And uh, I mean, you, you think of some of the things you see, uh, I think we've all seen ducking around on ice in, in, in the wintertime and they never get frostbit and that has to do a lot to do with their circulatory system. They have little bypasses. It's pretty involved in their, their legs that help this, but also with their body temperature being a lot higher than a, than a human being. Next, we're going to go on to the respiratory system. In a second here, you'll see an internal diagram of a bird's respiratory system. And uh, 
I'll talk about it here as it's coming up. First thing is that, yes, they do have lungs, very efficient lungs. Their respiratory system, once again, is, is amazing uh, as far as uh, its ability to oxygenate versus some of the mammals. Uh, their lungs do not act like our lungs. They don't have a diaphragm like our diaphragm is causing our lungs to get bigger and smaller as, as we inhale or exhale. Their lungs are pretty well stationary and they are an organ that just allows oxygen to pass through it, oxygenated air to pass through it. What's causing the movement of this oxygenated air, a variety of air sacs that can have up to nine air sacs, which kind of act like a little bellows that uh, uh, brings the air in and out. I'm jumping to another slide here now, which is gonna be showing you the uh, flow of the oxygenated air. It's showing inhalation right now. And once that slide comes up, you will see the lungs, the area in the center, and you will see some air sacs. And some of them are red, some of them are blue. The red ones are showing fresh air, oxygenated air. The system, respiratory system on a bird is one directional, unidirectional, meaning that it's always being refreshed with oxygen rich air. Uh, many times when we bring in and out, there is a huge mixture of already air that has already been. Uh, um, has the oxygen removed, I guess is the best way to say it. And although we are bringing in fresh, uh, fresh oxygenated air, there is a mixture and it's not totally efficient. There is always a fair amount of air in our trachea that we're re-inhaling. Um, what's happening here with a, with a bird, this oxygenated air goes and it fills various air sacs and those air sacs then, uh, force the air through the lungs, the spent air is then forced into some of the other air sacs, which is then uh, uh, released once again. So um, it's amazing, but the, uh, uh, that's why you can see geese, they're, they're flying at thousands of feet where first of all, the air is thin, but they can fly for eight, 10, 12 hours Small birds are flying across the um, Gulf of Mexico, and obviously they have a very, very efficient uh, respiratory system. So once again, here's a system that I would consider is, is surpasses that of uh, most mammals. Next, we're gonna go into the digestive system. And in a second here, you'll see a schematic once again of a bird's digestive system. And uh, so many things, there are some unique things about the digestive system. Number one is that uh, uh, they don't have a bladder. So they don't want to be flying around carrying extra weight in their bladder. So it goes from their kidneys and expelled outside of their body. So uh, there's, once again, a system that's designed to uh, make them lighter and the ability to fly. And uh, hopefully the slide is up in front of you. Now, and a couple unique things you'll see over on the left-hand side, there's a crop. Not every bird has a crop, but there is a, uh, a system uh, in their esophagus. And in a way, a lot of people call it their lunchbox. And what happens here, many birds have to get out exposed to potential predators and have to eat quick and then have to once again get in a, in a subdued area, and uh, this crop then will actually hold some of the food that they can, in a sense, um, force up, and it'll go in down their digestive system. Now, there's basically two different types of uh, uh, digestive, parts of their digestive stomach, and you can see the first thing there, the proventriculus, and it's drawn kind of small, it's a darker area and part of their esophagus there, but that is a, a stomach almost identical to ours. That is a stomach that's gonna be very well developed in a, a 
a carnivore type bird because it's rich in acid. Once again, it's going to uh, break down the proteins and starches. All right, and uh, so uh, a bird, you know, is, is, take a, a hawk for example, is going to have a, a more pronounced, well developed proventriculus, the granular type of a stomach here. The other type of stomach is going to be more pronounced in a, a seed or berry eating bird, and that's something we sometimes call the gizzard. It's kind of a muscular type of the stomach, which grinds, and actually some birds will swallow tiny little pellets that will actually uh, remain in the uh, gizzard, and it'll help grind up and crush these seeds and then pass it through the system. There are, you know, percentage-wise, their intestinal system is, is quite a bit smaller than, than you'd find in a mammal. Once again, this is all something that is there uh, to help giving it the ability to fly. All right, now we're gonna go into some simple things. I think a lot of you will all already be uh, familiar with this, but we're gonna talk about how to identify a bird. And uh, I'll go through some of these things fairly quickly. I think most of us are, are, uh, are birders. And uh, so we'll talk about size. So. If you're out with a birder, many times the first thing you're gonna do when you see a bird, you wanna to try to narrow down what size we have. And, and there should be a slide in front of you now that kind of shows, I usually narrow it down into three different sizes. You'll see things that are more crow or hawk size. You'll see more, some birds, the medium sized birds are robin or cardinal or blue jay size. And then you'll see the smaller size, which are the uh, uh, sparrows, all our warblers are that size, hatches, things like that. So we identify birds like that. So on the larger scale, hopefully you will see a, a goose in front of you right now. So if we see a bird that big, it narrows down what the possibilities are for identifying that bird. Then following, we have a blue jay. And a blue jay would be something we would call more of our medium-sized bird. And then we have the uh, uh, chickadee here, which uh, is a bird that is around most of the year for us. And we would consider that being on the smaller side. Next, we're in our identifying chart. We're gonna talk about the shape of birds and uh, it's so important when we find a bird, especially when you're finding a bird that you haven't seen before, that you check some of these things out. Number one is the type of bill it has. The bill is gonna tell us so much as to uh, where the bird lives, what the bird feeds on, and we can quickly narrow down in our birding book as to where it might be to help to identify it. Uh, one of the things that we do notice on most birds or help identify, I'll talk about this a little bit more too, is, is the relationship of the bill of a bird to the uh, size of the head. And I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Right now I have a hummingbird, ruby throated hummingbird up on the screen. And once again, because of the type of bill, we can pretty well determine what potentially that bird might eat. Next up on the screen, I'm just showing some wings, all right? And you can see a variety of wings here, type of birds up in the top. You see a turkey vulture, which has a broad finger type wing, and that would provide many of our hawks, our red-tailed hawks, which we see around here, our, our uh, bald eagles and so on, have a broad wing like that, and many times a broad tail that helps them to navigate in the air and, and soar for a long period of time. Over on the left, we have a, a falcon, okay? And a falcon now, you can see that he has more of a swept back, or excuse me, not swept back, more of a, a pointed wing, and uh, the falcons can reach speeds up to 200 miles an hour in a dive. So they are, their wings are designed for speed. So this is crucial when you see a bird flying, you try to identify the size 
and shape of that wing and its tail. And lastly, you can see that we have a, a, a nighthawk here, I believe, that uh, has a swept back wing that gives it a, a great maneuverability in the air for catching bugs and so on. Next up on the screen, hopefully, is the our bird feet. And although in trying to identify birds, uh, it's not always easy to see their feet, but uh, sometimes um, if you're looking at some shorebirds, many times it, you can identify and the beat feet tell us a lot. You can see that over on the top left, we have a coot and a little black swimming bird with a white bill and uh, see a lot of those around if you go out to Horicon Marsh and so on. And they don't really have a web foot, but they have webbing around for their to toes. And then we have a duck, hawk. You can see a woodpecker. He's got to climb up and down a tree. So toes are in position to be able to uh, walk up and down the tree. And uh, you know, a variety of other types of birds for running and so on. And uh, or a uh, lot of your shore birds will have larger toes which allow them off the lily pads or in swampy areas without sinking into the water. Up on the screen now, I, I have two woodpeckers, and we're just going to talk about these two. Here are two things that, uh, two woodpeckers that we find in our backyard a lot. And if you look at these two, uh, they look very much alike. Uh, there are two different species right now, and uh, the woodpecker over on the left, which looks very much like the woodpecker on the right, uh, the head looks a little bit different. That's only because the on the right, it's a downy woodpecker. The feathers, he's kind of got his feathers uh, um, brushed up, uh, but that they many times will look identical to the hairy woodpecker on the, on the left on hand side. And so if you see these, if you don't see them side by side, a downy woodpecker is a substantially, uh, maybe about 70% uh, the size of a hairy woodpecker. All right, so if you see them not together, it's very hard to identify them. So what, what do we do? Well, I talked a little bit earlier about the size of the, the bill in relation to the head. And uh, on the left, you can see our, our hairy woodpecker, which is about a nine inch bird. And if you look at the ratio of the bill to the head, it's the best way to identify one from the other, because sometimes you see a big downy and a small hairy, you never know. So this is uh, just some of the ways that we use to help identify these particular birds. Um, okay, we're just gonna talk about uh, sight and color. We talked about feathers earlier. Right now I have a bluebird that's actually sitting on one of Mary Hollebeck's uh, uh, bird boxes there out at River Edge. I took this picture a while back, but um, uh, if you go out and see some of her birdhouses, you'll see that there is there is some kind of a blue bird in many of her houses, but many, many of her birdhouses have tree swallows in. And they also have a blue back, but they don't have that rufous color, brownish color test like a bluebird would have. So uh, the uh, coloration of feathers is very significant. And as I think most of you know that uh, uh, males, the male bird will usually have uh, uh, significantly brighter colors. Not always true. I mean, look at a robin sometime, a male and a female, hard to tell. But you look at cardinals and things like that, the male has brighter colors and uh, they're meant to uh, attract the female, you know. Of course, men never show off, so, but uh, some birds might, I guess. Uh, they want to uh, attract the female with a paw and, uh, and also their coloration. Interesting to note that uh, many first year, first year males coming back might not quite be as colorful, and they might not always have that bird song perfected, and it's been, discovered that many first year returning migrants uh, don't always attract a mate until they perfect that. If they 
They're lucky enough to be one of the birds returning the second year. If they make it a second year, the percentage is very high that they're going to return multiple years. But uh, they usually have that song and that uh, color down to attract a female. Next up on the screen here, I have a white-throated sparrow. Now you can see right, there's some yellow areas right here and I'm pointing to if you do see that. Okay, it's called the lores and, and uh, sparrows are very hard to identify. Number one, they're usually moving very fast, okay? But you always have to look for this, this coloration. That yellow right there is not always very significant. Sometimes it's, it's very small. I took this picture down in North Carolina and just happened to get perfect lighting. I, you can see how that, that area is has uh, stood out. All right, I'm bringing up two birds right now, and sometime if you were to see these two females, these are two female birds, and they, you see them and you can see that they're, they're very, very similar. So they're also almost the same size. The bird on the left is probably one of the most misidentified birds in Wisconsin. It just looks no distinguishing characteristics, okay? And these females obviously are, are duller in color because uh, they're the one used on the nest to protect the eggs, so they're going to be a little more camouflaged. But here's two birds. If you see them, it would be very hard to identify. But here, let's take a look. Uh, I, Move the slide ahead here, and you can see one of the things that we're looking at is, are the bills. And uh, the bill on the right, um, all right, folks are seeing this, giving me a signal that my internet is unstable, but hopefully things are moving ahead here. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the right is a gross beak and obviously has a little bit. Uh, different bill than the female red-winged blackbird. Free female red-winged blackbirds are, you see them and you look at a bird sometime very quickly and it's very hard to identify what the bird might be and that one is one that is misdiagnosed. All right, we're going to have a little fun here now. You can't respond and talk in a few calls and I'm going to play a couple calls and we're just going to do some real simple sound identification. Our first one here. Starting out real easy for you. Hopefully you're seeing, you're hearing that. And what we have here is a great horned owl. Okay. And uh, these guys are birds that uh, are here. They're not migrants. They stay here all year round. Uh, they're pretty lazy birds. They don't usually build nests. They try to find an old nest and they, they're, they're nesting in late January, February. So, uh, but you'll hear them calling uh, now too. So you, you can sometime even play a call and have them return a call to you. But uh, pretty interesting. The biggest owl we have in Wisconsin. Here's our next one. All right, and uh, I hope you're right yet, be able to identify it. We're doing some easy ones, but there's our good old crow. We don't have ravens here. Ravens are farther north. Those in this area, and uh, they're pretty smart birds. I'll tell you, it's really hard to get close to a crow, much less trying to take a picture of a crow. All right, we're going to go to the next one here. A little tougher now. All right, that's our state bird. Hope everybody was able to identify that guy. And it's our robin. All right, and we will. If we're not hearing them right now, we'll be hearing these guys uh, singing a lot, you know, and as long as they're not uh, adhering to that uh, stay in your nest regulation that's out there right now, I guess. All right, next.
All right, here's one, something that we should have been hearing for about the last uh, uh, three, four weeks, and that's our, our cardinal. I'm gonna keep moving along here. All right, next. All right, we have one we showed you earlier, and uh, it's our red-winged blackbird. All right, that's one we've been hearing also for a few weeks, and that's something you can hear from a long distance away. And uh, there's our, our sandhill cranes. All right, we're going to go into next part. We're going to go into site, and uh, by site I mean is where what habitat? Where where do we actually find these birds? And it's so important to identify, for example, if you're driving by a big field and you see a big tall bird walking around, uh, you, if you weren't uh, familiar with it, you might think, oh, it may, might be a great blue here. And I hear people tell me that all the time versus a sandhill crane. So you're re really important to identify the, the location of these birds. And then move on, keep moving along here. So our time is running down. And uh, talk about a few migratory things. Uh, you know, what triggers migration? It's a, uh, it's a reenactment part of, you know, birds have been moving. If you see the, the diagram down below that, it should appear in a second. It shows that birds farther up in the latitude, a higher percentage of birds there uh, migrate. In a warmer climate, climate uh, for food and so on, okay? And uh, it's triggered by the ultraviolet light. It's usually their time clock telling them when to move. And uh, how do they migrate, all right? Uh, they actually detect my, my, uh, magnetic fields, okay? They also they use visual markers because we know that the great migratory path, for example, in this area is right along Lake Michigan, all right? Um, most small birds migrate at night, so there is the um, chance of using the stars and the moon. So you, you, the birds you see migrating are usually the bigger birds, geese, ducks, and so on. But the smaller birds, um, sometimes if you have a very clear moonlit night with clouds that brings them down low, you can hear or see the smaller birds migra migrating. But they basically have an internal compass. And, uh, uh, how far do they migrate? It is estimated. It's estimated that you know, about half of the birds in the world do migrate. Of the ten thousand species of birds, about half of them migrate. And one most unique is the Arctic tern, which uh, goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. And uh, Another significant one here, the thing here is the number of birds and do they die? And it's estimated that there is about, in North America, this is 10 billion birds. And in fall, after all the young have hatched, it's 18 to 20 billion birds uh, will be around North America. And, uh, uh, but during that migration, almost 45, percent of the birds will die during migration. Buildings are a, a big part of collision, uh, collision with the towers and buildings. Automobiles kill 60 million birds a year. And uh, uh, just talking about the birds, some of the last birds that we've had around here, uh, our passenger pigeon, which last one was around here in 1914, Basically, human impact, human hunting uh, wiped out the, the passenger pigeon. Uh, as far as the ivory-billed woodpecker, the, uh, the type of uh, tree growth, the larger tree growth it needed down in the Louisiana area um, uh, was, was removed because of human impact in many cases, and uh, it lost its habitat. So they haven't been seen for a long time. Occasionally, you hear somebody say they see one, but they... Uh, I think they now have definitely said the bird is extinct and the great auk was probably the other one in, in recent times that uh, was wiped out. 
I want to talk real quickly about bird books. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes because this is so important. And if you see on your screen right now, you see some bird books. These are the ones that you could have probably bought 25, 30 years ago. The one on the left there, the Robins, uh, Birds of North America, very common bird. But what has happened over, uh, some significant changes, I should actually say, have happened over the past uh, um, 15 years because of this bird uh, that was found on Vega Island and it was a, a duck type bird and it totally changed their bird books. If you have a bird book before 2005, if you look at it, a North American bird book, you're going to see loons uh, and grebes being the first one. And bird books are set up in evolutionary order. That's the way they flow, right? So because of this bird that was found in 2000, uh, uh, 1992, it took about 15 years to all the ornithologists to really get on board to recognize this as, as a new species and it totally changed our bird books, all right? And, uh, and, and now ducks and geese are the first in our bird book. So if you're gonna get a bird book, make sure it's published after 2005. A lot of other things have happened, for example, uh, because of DNA testing now, they were able to put birds in better categories. For example, a bird, I used to love to say this name, the roof sided towhee, now is the spotted towhee or the eastern towhee. So there was a one species bird that was divided into two. And just the opposite of that, for example, was the Audubon warbler and the Myrtle warbler, which when I was a beginning burbler, a birder, they both were around. And now it's um, called the yellow rump warbler. And uh, for example, some of the older books, you will probably see four or five different types of juncos. And now there's only um, uh, two types of juncos. I'm going to stop here. That's basically all the information that hopefully stimulates some questions. I'm going to give you a little time if any questions come up. Thank you, Dan. We definitely have questions that came up in the chat. So I'll read you some of those. And um, you can let me know if you have some ideas um, or if other people have ideas too. We can certainly do that as well. So first of all, that was so interesting. That was great. I learned tons. Um, myself and i i'll totally admit i am not a birder um i enjoy birds but i'm not good at identifying birds and uh especially about their biology and things that was great there's some uh great. fun facts that i will definitely remember so um so one of the questions is can a new species be developed as opposed to being found does that make sense um yes so basically we're saying uh uh that there might be the bird has adapted differently or whatever. I don't have any experience of that happening in, in our time. I mean, these, these new species, this takes a period of thousands of years. So definitely in our lifetime, this might, uh, it, it didn't happen. But if we were able to go back and look at the amount of the types of birds a thousand years ago, maybe things have adapted or, or split apart. So. Excellent. Um, the next one is about the eggshells. So uh -huh. is the membrane inside of a bird's eggshell an evolutionary remnant um, related to the leathery shells of reptiles? Do you know anything about that? I don't. Mary, uh, are you on there? Do you have any idea about that one? No, got me too. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, I'll I look it up know. and let somebody know. So. I know this. <laughs> Yay, oh, Casey! Have... Yeah. Right. So um, the bird eggs and reptile eggs are very, very similar in terms of internal structure. However, um, reptile eggs have very little albumin um, because they need to absorb water from their environment. Uh, the hard shell of a bird egg doesn't really let that that moisture in. So um, some desert reptiles have hard shells um, to avoid that. So just another exception to the rule. But in terms of structure, they're, they're very similar. So Fantastic. When, you must awesome. be an expert. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Dan. Nice. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, we have a couple. Thank you, Casey. That was awesome. Um, so Dan, we have a couple questions about bird books. So I'm glad you ended with that, but like specific recommendations that you have, because we know there's so many out there for good, right. a good beginner book, maybe um, one you could use with kids, but also maybe of a more advanced book as well. Well, one book that I really love, I'll show you this here. This is, is it backwards on the screen? No, it's good. We can see it right, even though it looks okay. backwards to you. All right. So it's, it's, uh, I, I love this bird, National Geographic uh, book. It, it's a little more advanced, but it's, it's one, it's, it's fairly, a little big, but it's easy to carry in the field. One thing I really like about it, if I just turn to the first page here, is that it gives you a quick reference. So if you, you see a, a grebe and you're not sure what grebe it is, you can quickly turn to the page. It's really easy to handle. It's, it's a, a little bit bigger than some of the original ones that were out there. Maybe I hold this back a little bit more, but I, I, I really like this. Now, Sibley's also has, has a book. It's a, it's a bigger book. I usually keep this uh, around the house, right? It's not an easy one to carry out in the field, but Sibley's has quite a few different books. And now these would be for somebody that was uh, a little bit more into it, but I think, uh, and maybe Mary could help us here too, Golden Book, I think have certain books out. Uh, you know, one thing, th these books I'm showing you here are, like I mentioned, are in an evolutionary order. And it's important to look for a book like that, I think, because there are some books out there that are structured by color, they're, they're in-house books to, to use around your bird feeder by, by color, by size, different things like that. But uh, if you take the next step, it's going to be very confusing if you start out with a book like that. Mary, do you have some ideas? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Stan Tequila puts out a book that's the Birds of Wisconsin, and that one is arranged according to bird color, just like the Guide to Wildflowers. But that is definitely a beginner's book. It does not show what the female looks like. It doesn't show what the immatures look like. That's the advantage to having like a Sibley's or a Kaufman's book, which shows all those different color phases and different age of the, the birds, whether they're immature or adult birds and so on. So it uh, depends on what your level is. Um, we do use the Golden Guide to Birds um, with the students that come and mainly because it's inexpensive um, and it's been around forever, um, tried and true book and um, it has its limitations, but it's a good beginner book and, and very inexpensive. Excellent. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mary. Hopefully everybody has a good recommendation based on your level of birding and who you're um, doing that birding with. Let's see. We've got great questions here. One's, uh, the next question is about bluebirds. And the fact it looks like Tom has been seeing many more bluebirds this season than in the past. Um, is there an overall uh, resurgence of bluebirds? Are the dead ash trees, do they provide any habitat? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to pass that on to Mary. She's our bluebird expert here. So, <laughs> Yeah, bluebirds have um, been in, uh, actually increasing in numbers over the last 20 or more years. A lot of it because of the efforts of all the various different groups, including the North American Bluebird Society, the Wisconsin Bluebird Society. Uh, they're all putting out boxes and doing things to, you know, uh, provide habitat and, and good housing for the bluebirds. Um, and they've also, um, there's less of the things like DDT that was used years ago that brought their numbers down. And uh, so all in all, yeah, their numbers are increasing. And uh, again, with a decrease in some of the non-native species, that's helped the bluebirds too. So uh, a lot of farmers are taking measures to uh, get rid of um, house sparrows and starlings, which are major enemy of bluebirds. And that is a perfect segue, Mary, to our next question, <laughs> which is there a way to keep swallows out of bluebird houses? Ooh, yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah, like so the thing. Oh, go um, ahead. Yeah. So bluebirds and swallows and house wrens and chickadees all fit in the same size hole in the nest box. Uh, and so one of the best ways to avoid getting swallows in your boxes is to put them uh, in habitat that, that uh, swallows don't care for. 
Uh, so bluebirds will take um, areas that are open fields away from water where swallow would prefer to be closer to water. Uh, however, if you have enough swallows, you're going to have high competition for any box. So uh, some people have tried putting little streamers on the top of the box and that kind of thing. Um, it, it works for a little while, but may not totally discourage them. So the best solution is to try to find the ideal habitat for each species and then put boxes um, in those places, but don't overdo it with the boxes because bluebird boxes should be at least 100 yards apart, not 100 feet, but 100 yards apart. If you put too many houses up, you're just going to get a lot more tree swallows than, than bluebirds. Um, Mary, can you briefly talk about, uh, you know, how the bluebird houses are checked and sure. what, like, kind of what you would do, uh, what you're supposed to do if you have a bluebird house up sure. in your property? Ideally, you would want to, um, first of all, go out there and clean it out uh, either at the end of the season or be get before the season begins, which would be like mid-March. Uh, and then um, ideally, uh, get out there at least once a week, starting in about mid-April all the way through to the end of July. And just check that there are no problems, ants, wasps, whatever, um, to, so you can kind of work to control some of those uh, little insect pests, but also that way you know what you know what's happening in each of the boxes and whether you have one of those invasive species like a house sparrow or a starling trying to take over a nest box. In which case, you could just lock up the box for a week. Um, hope the the tree sparrow, sparrow goes somewhere else and then open it back up for a bluebird. But all the other nesting uh, species are all protected by state and federal law, so you. You can't really disturb them while they're nesting. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, I think maybe that's the end of this. If you look in the of the questions that are in the chat, that is. Um, Natalie did put a link. Um, if people are looking for uh, any kind of field guides, uh, we do have a nature store at River Edge. So if you're looking to buy locally, there's it's online. We have a link there in chat but you can also it look uh, find it on our website and we do do curbside pickup but then there's also uh links in the chat that natalie provided for the guides that were mentioned as well so you could go ahead and copy and paste that um into like a, a word document or open that on your computer and see that oh karen had one more question here we go we have wood ducks and pileated woodpeckers in our woods some birds is uh, are making a very clear sound, but we aren't sure which bird it is. What do you, these two birds sound like? Okay, so what are what does a wood duck sound like, Dan, versus a pileated woodpecker? Wow, um, I you know what I would do is just go to the uh, Google it, and you'll hear the sounds. Would be the easier easiest way rather than me trying to. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Try, try. Ooh, that's about as far as I can go. So, <laughs> but uh, if you go, if you Google it and, and you get into uh, some of the sites, they all will play uh, the sounds back to you, and you, you would get a real clear-cut answer to that question. So, Excellent. if you know what a flicker sounds like, um, a pileated woodpecker sounds very much like. A, a flicker. So that might be a clue uh, as to which species you have. Wood ducks really are, aren't a quacking type of duck, but they, their wings um, when they are in flight do kind of make a whistling sound. So that might be a clue too. But you know, yeah, hard to know unless you actually see what's, what's coming and going from the hole. Come Excellent. on, Mary, make one of the calls for us. I want to hear it. So <laughs> no way. <laughs> I mean, the pileated woodpecker re reminds me of a very prehistoric sound, like like a pterodactyl or something. So, um, if you hear one, it's it's pretty distinctive. I've never heard a pterodactyl, but <laughs> me neither. Have, so. <laughs> Been around that long, though. I have Is a wood. It? I have a wood duck sound. Oh, here you go. Ah, I see. Oh, come on. Now it won't play, of course. Oh, here we go. Interesting. Cool. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank is you, that, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon, do you have an app on your phone? Or is that- I do. I have several apps. <laughs> Any chance you'd mind sharing which one you like the best? 
Well, I bro I I Bird Pro has a lot of bird sounds, so I like that and has photos. And then I also have Cornell Labs for other purposes. And then I also use Merlin ID because it has those easy, quick identification, like the size of the bird. So I like those three apps. That's I don't know if you can see this. I have yeah. uh, Peterson's uh, Birds of North America. It's really that. easy to use also, has all the sounds and the nesting sites. And you can do a quick search on this. So I, I think they're free, most of these nowadays. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So that's a nice way to uh, get some basic bird identification. And I love the idea of sharing how you have the sounds too on there in the calls. That's wonderful. It's been a little bit of a problem for some birders though, because there are some more inexperienced birders that are out in areas where other birders are and they're using the calls and upsetting people. So they're, they're the uh, associations are really setting up a lot of restrictions as to when you should use these particular bird calls. So, so uh, yeah, bring uh, earbuds along in your pocket. So <laughs> yeah, there, right. You can, uh, listen to it and then take them out and listen. That's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something that many of us probably wouldn't have thought of. So sure. that's great. Wonderful. Well, I think that is what we have for today. Um, Natalie wrote in the chat some of those those apps. If you're if you didn't quite catch those, you can look there. And then Ed mentioned um, that the Cornell All About Birds website. If you Google that, that that's a wonderful um, place to find bird sounds too. Yep. Um, so with that, I just want to quick uh, turn it back over to Natalie to tell us what's on Doc. Um, before we give one last thank you to Dan, uh, but Natalie, why don't you talk about next week? Yeah, next week we have um, Mike Reesar coming uh, to present, well, from the comfort of his own home, presenting um, on the Peregrine Falcon Restoration Project that We Energies organizes. Um, and they are also doing some um, recovery work for eagles and ospreys. So he's going to talk about um, mm. all those raptor recovery programs. And then the week after that, Casey, do you want to do your own plug? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so I, if you would like to come on May 20th, I am going to be doing a presentation on uh, some of the fossils you can find around the Great Lakes region. So Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, that general region. So some of the basics to what you need to find your own fossils, um, how to look and find uh, your and start your own collection, and just some of the history, the geological history of uh, the area. Perfect. Yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. That came out of we were on uh, our Monday morning uh, start the week right coffee clutch uh, with River Edge staff members and Casey uh, brought out these rocks and like split them and showed how these split them in half and they were fern fossils. It was so cool. So we're like, oh, we need to know more about this. So we're very excited for that. Yeah. Well, Dan, all, all the oh. secret spots to go. <laughs> Excellent. So that'll be fun. All of those will be fun. So thank you, Dan. This was wonderful. Hopefully it encourages us as encourages all of us to go out there and, and watch birds maybe even more than we do. If anything, we all learned something today and we know learning is a lifelong endeavor. So thank you so much and Good. it was great to see so many uh, River Edge faces around and, and all of that. So you all have a wonderful day and hopefully we'll see you next week. <laughs> all right, see ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Dan. Goodbye, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Dan. It was great. <laughs> great job, Dan. <laughs>